on the sticks. Of the motor car, okay, um, and uh, you know, where did it come from? 
and the heroes, you know, the influential people, like Henry Ford, what he did, and how he managed to do production lines, and how they revolutionized driving, and, uh, you know, four songs versus six versus eight, and how they all work, and transmissions, exhaust systems, tire pressure systems, and how that affects the driving efficiency, the safety, you know, so you eventually see in there after about five years, <laughs> after seven years, you get to sit in the passenger seat. Uh, after about ten years, it actually gets to the driver's seat, but you have a fireproof suit, a helmet, a roll cage, uh, and a completely open field where you uh, were allowed to do a very minimal sort of uh, sort of driving around in circles to start with, you know, with a you know a passenger on the side, also having a steering wheel to correct anything you would do wrong. Right. And you'd have to pass, of course, fifty thousand tests to memorise parts of the car. The tire pressures for different brands of cars, etc., etc., and where they're made and what's the routine. <coughs> Finally, after about 30 years, you'd actually be able to drive on the street with the five other people that have managed to actually learn that. Isn't that bizarre? Because <laughs> that's how we teach everything else in schools at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, really, is Aztecs worth learning and, you know, algebra? Really? I mean, do you ever use that again? No. It's not sure you bother learning it. It's a big waste of time. Yeah? Nice, nice these days, these days, you know, I've got in my pocket a phone, uh, therefore I have a library. You know, if I want to know something, it's in here. You know, of course, some stores have done the usual thing of banning the things that actually are the most powerful tool ever <laughs> produced on the planet for learning. Uh, we, banned, we banned the compass when it first came out because maths teachers thought that compasses should be banned because people should be able to draw circles by bring Yeah, that was actually a really important skill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Slide balls are banned too, by the way, just for the record. Uh, just in case there's something important. Count those, banned those, of course. Uh, cell phones, you know, the most powerful education tool ever produced. Yeah, banned those straight away uh, because kids could cheat. Unlike us, who don't cheat. How does that work? Like, where's the morality or the ethical sort of thinking here? And it's just completely absent. People don't stand back and actually look at themselves and go, what we're doing is really, really silly. It really is. You know, and you have to sort of hold up the mirror sometimes and go, actually, we're really, really silly people. Mm -hmm. And people make the mistake of thinking that human beings are logical, sensible, and rational. And I've never met one person who can see even one person there. And we all do dumb things. Uh, regularly, actually, it's a really dumb thing to do regularly. You know? um, people look around you and look and say, you know, look at the people in the audience here, and you, know, and you look around and say, don't they have a mirror at home? Why are they wearing those colors? They're just as hard, you know? Why is it that they're wearing that stupid red jacket, you know? Why would you do that, you know? Um, because we're passionate and non rational, aren't we? That's the nature. That's the nature of who we are. We're passionate and non rational. Uh, and uh, that's what we have to try and accept. That makes us interesting though, because if we're all logical, sensible, and rational, imagine how boring that would be. People would drive boring cars and do boring things, women's magazines, well, they'd be over, because people were rational, sensible, and logical, they wouldn't do dumb things. Uh, so they'd have to do Not to talk about, you know, the morning tea. You have to talk about teaching and learning, maybe, instead of, you know, what happened on the weekend. Yeah. And why people got drunk and did silly things, you know, because that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's a totally logical thing to do. About it for a moment. So we need to start thinking about what we know about teaching and learning and shifting what we do to accommodate that. And that's true also the knowledge net. We've been looking at that uh, for the last year or so, uh, and I've been sort of trying to review what could we or should we be doing with the knowledge net. Because really, as a learning management system, it's not that different to when we started 10 years ago building the knowledge net. It was about putting stuff somewhere so kids could actually learn it. Okay. And what we've seen in New Zealand, and New Zealand does lead the world in this space by a country mile, by the way, uh, is that when New Zealand, what we've shifted to is actually the focus has gone away from remembering stuff, uh, theoretically, uh, of course, there's always standards. Standards don't work, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I have absolute proof of that, um, and that just, it just doesn't work at all. Uh, and, um, for example, if we... Uh, if we look at this wonderful study in the United States, um, this is the reading test scores for 40 years. Let me put up a minute. 220,000 students test over 40 years. So every year they test a batch of kids, 220,000 of them. 
okay, and to see how the standards are going. Here are the reading test scores. And you see they've raced away from 285 right up to 286. It's a stunning achievement, you know. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And it's mostly because, in fact, reading is rote learnt. And so you have a, a natural limitation, and that is the parents of those children who gave birth to those children passed on the gene code. There's a limitation as to how good you can teach reading and writing. And we've actually got really, really good at that. And there's nothing more you can really do. So, and given that you've got the raw material coming in, there's no way you can actually make any better. You just simply can't. It's just not possible. There's nothing we can do to teach rote learned reading and writing because it's all rote learned. You know, 26 letters. They're totally random. Um, you know, you can't what you can't show get an A and it's an A sound or an R sound, B, B or B sound, C. Now predict D. You just can't. <laughs> you know? You've got to learn all 26, you know? And then you combine them in random order to form words, like ant. You can't look at the word and go, what do you think this word means? You can't work it out. It's all rote learned. And that rote learning is 100% inherited from your parents. The capacity. Okay. 100%. So it means that what's happened is that it's just a flat line. So anything that's learned by a rote and tested can't actually improve. It's nothing you can do okay? So you can measure this to the cows come home, but nothing will improve. Which is why the minister and various people describe, or the prime minister describes it as rote. Yeah, <laughs> what does that mean? I don't actually know what rote means, but I'm guessing it means it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, because it won't. You, know, you can't increase standards. Australia's just start to learn that the standards a bit longer than us, and they're just starting to realise these standards have increased quite a bit. In fact, the lovely headline in the Sydney Morning Herald recently saying, you know, spent $524 million, and standards have gone down 1.4%. <laughs> you know, it's best not people to bother with it, because what's happening now is people are focusing on that as opposed to actually focusing on the learning. And so, if you take your eye off the ball about learning, then the actual capacity for kids to do creative and a whole bunch of other things disappears, it becomes boring. Boring means you have different hormones in your head, as I explained to you this afternoon, uh, and uh, that means you learn much slower. So it's all sort of a downward spiral, which is about measuring standards, and that's what's happening around the world, and they simply can't, they can't move. If you were to measure standards around something that was something you could understand and predict, then that's a different matter altogether. So mathematics standards should actually be able to be improved dramatically. In fact, you could, by changing the curriculum a little bit, you could change uh, the results of mathematics, I, I would say, probably close to one or two hundred percentage points. Okay? So here's mathematics uh, test scores in the United States with the same sample group. It's raised away from 304 to 306. <laughs> April 20, from 1973 uh, to 2008. The 2011 test scores just come out and they're about the same. Right. So you can't actually increase the capacity of young people's learning when it comes to rote learning. Well, that's your worst learning system. You have a second learning system, and that's all about concepts and understanding ideas, and concepts and concept frameworks. Uh, and, um, and interestingly, uh, driving is a concept, right? which is why you don't remember it, actually. Try here this morning. You don't remember actually particularly turning off to do sections, do you? And you can drive at all, have a nice time from all the way back. And go, I don't even remember actually driving in the city. I can't even go in the bridge. You know, and you all think you're sort of losing your marbles, but you're not really. Uh, this is one of the most clever uh, operating systems uh, for learning ever. You can actually, and we're the only species, by the way, to do this. We're the only species that can learn concepts on the fly. No other species can do that. Okay, so birds fly. You know, the southern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, to get away from the cold winter. They don't sit around and go, oh, it's got a jolly cold, let's move, you know. Uh, they don't think that. They don't arrive in Canada and go, no, I've been coming here for years, come back to Europe next year. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just don't do that, you know. Um, whereas humans do, you know. So birds only have one upper learning system, and that's by a rote. Okay? They can learn stuff by a rote. Very slow, but they can do it. Monkeys can do the same. Okay? Dolphins can do the same. But well, they're not intelligent. Human beings are the only intelligent species on the planet. Uh, because none of those other species can actually come up with new concepts on the fly. 
they can genetically make changes over many, many generations through the evolutionary sort of process. Right? And they can adapt, but it's a very, very slow process. We can adapt instantly okay, by making a decision. And no other species can do that. So this whole notion of that we're, we're almost the same as monkeys, I'm going, we're not even close. So my monkeys, 97% of the genome is the same for a monkey as a human being. I have to say to people, it's all about maths. You know, it's the concept of understanding mathematics. Okay, and if not, so, picking six numbers is jolly hard, but it is. It's about one in 13 million. Okay, get that right. right. How about picking another one? Let's add one more to that, shall we? And how much more difficult does that make that process of picking the right numbers? It's just suddenly you've got another, you know, we're up now to 300 million, million one in 300 million. It's never not even going to do it. So imagine just adding another 3% of the genome, which is now another 3 million sequences to the number of combinations you could probably put together. So that 3% is just massive. The difference is just extraordinary. Right. So you can't look at the monkey and go, oh, they're almost right next to each other. No, you're not. <laughs> Fortunately for you. So you have a second concept formation scheme, and that happens in your brain also, but uh, it doesn't have much to do with neurons, actually. Uh, it has a little cell in the brain that manages that process, and that's not talked about that stuff. Then. So you've got the second one is concepts, and everybody does that the same. So when you do your driving test, smart people don't learn to drive faster than non-smart people, do they? Now you're in the learning business, have you ever wondered why? One second. You know, non smart people don't drive worse than smart people. In fact, it's reverse. <laughs> <laughs> well, why is that? How can kids all learn to pass a test? You know, driving test, 98% pass rate. That's for that that you stand for three words. Who's it taught by? Complete morons, generally speaking. <laughs> <laughs> no preparation whatsoever, you know. Just turn up in the car. Oh, my daughter's saying to me, you know, she's sitting there and the driver says, Dad, with the indicators up for left or down for left. And I have to go, I can get down. Yeah, she's not going to do it, Jay. Get up. No, no, it's not. She's just like, down for left. And she looked at me and said, Dad, it's supposed to be my teacher. <laughs> Heroes, 
plants, and let's learn lots of stuff. But what happened is we just learned lots of stuff to remember. You know, kids, do they really need to understand the photosynthetic process? And the answer is absolutely not. A big waste of time, that is. You know, do you need to know that plants need sunlight? Yeah, that's useful. But if you know that's all about carbon dioxide molecules reacting with water molecules, the sort of all these sugar molecules and the chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll is this, the different wavelengths of light, different frequencies. No, you don't. Just make a better garden. <laughs> So we have to be much more critical of what we do in the classroom ourselves, what actually we need to do. When you start doing that, once you start thinking about that, then things change significantly. And um, what we end up with is a model that looks something like this. Uh, and this is a sort of framework. Now, we, at least on the first bit right here in New Zealand, the whole fundamental is about confident, connected, actively involved, lifelong learners. Confidence is everything. If you're confident you can do something, you'll probably achieve it. Okay? When it comes to reading and writing, and this is for the junior schools, we shouldn't teach reading and writing, I'm guessing, for the first three to four months of school. Why? Why shouldn't we teach reading and writing in the first three or four months of school? Not primary school teachers, where are you? <laughs> Why should we not do that? It's a really dumb idea. If confidence is the first linchpin of actually becoming a lifelong learner, and you arrive in school and you haven't chosen your parents well, the first thing you have to do is something totally dependent on your parents' capacity that they pass on to you, how well are you going to think you can learn? So your first thing you have to do is dictated by a distribution unit, you know, which you have no choice in. It's now I can't read, therefore I can't learn. I can't remember that stuff very well. Michael, they can remember much better than I can. He's obviously smart. So they lose their confidence. So the idea of them actually giving things a go is going out the window. So they won't risk. So straight away, we've got a downhill slide for those children. So straight away, we have decided on day one at school who is going to win and who is going to lose. Based on how well they can remember 26 letters. And unless something really magical happens halfway through that process, that's going to dictate their life at school. The good thing is, though, that life at school doesn't actually dictate success in life full stop. In fact, school is a terrible arbitrator, you know, sort of, uh, of, or sort of predictor, of success later on in life. So, when we look at this, we're going to ask ourselves, if we really want to be lifelong learners, we have to understand the notion of confidence, reading, connectivity. And connectivity is about working with others and confidently contributing to that process. Okay, so confidently actively involved in your learning. In other words, the kids should be managing their learning. They should be managing their learning. Not you. You don't manage it for them. They manage it. So schooling is an apprenticeship, a 12-year apprenticeship. When they arrive, they're pretty dependent on you. Year 13 should be the easiest class to teach. Because by that stage, the kids should be pretty much running themselves. And you're just there to guide them along the way. <coughs> but as it happens, you do everything for them, and you complain about it bitterly, I must add. Okay? And they become useless when they leave school because then there's no one to hold their hand and tell them what to do. Yeah. Children today, aren't they just so useless? You know? And they're getting more useless with the parents who just pop around those helicopter parents, you know, sort of doing everything for them. I'll carry your bag for you. Can I drop you at the school gate? Because you know some weird person from outer space is going to capture you on the way to school. <laughs> so I mean, biking is far too dangerous, you know. It's just nonsense stuff. And we need to give our kids, and we're all guilty of us, and we're guilty of it, and bringing my kids up, you know. You want to protect them. A wonderful study five years ago, uh, uh, seven, seven years ago now, in the United Kingdom, looking at innovation. And the question was asked in innovation, what causes certain people to be innovative? And when they did that, they found one factor that had an effect size of 2.1, which is very, very high. Okay? So anything above sort of 0.6 is jolly good to do. 
What was that one effect size? What was that one thing you had to do for your children in order to make sure they were probably going to be innovators and sort of leaders in their communities, etc.? What was it? Do you think? Sorry? Partly, there's one other thing. Then you have got 
the ticket to success. Then your parents need to pick you out of home, send you to another country somewhere, for a while at least, and annex you out there and you're away. Right. <coughs> so there's a recipe for you. you know? If you want to have success, if you want to have totally dependent, useless people, really dig into that standard stuff, because that's really the epitome of just really things we shouldn't be doing. And so people do need to stand up and say, actually, it's a complete waste of time, mostly. You should know the numbers, you should know where kids are at. But the kids should be reporting on that themselves. Okay? So this model, what we're trying to sort of push really is sport and brains, uh, really. Uh, and really getting a teaching and learning pedagogical set of practices that do make sense. That actually are leveraging this capacity for lifelong learning. By giving kids confidence, by giving them experience to allow them to build their own confidence. Confidence is not you say to them, that's very good, Johnny, that's very good, Johnny, that's very good, Johnny. Confidence comes from asking clever, rich, open, fertile, hard of thinking questions. So what would you predict would happen if we like doubled the size of that? That gives kids confidence. Not telling them they're just jolly marvelous when they're not. Okay? The second thing is this environment. The student managers and learning managers in that integrated environment. We need to understand how the brain learns to understand how we influence kids in the classroom to do the sorts of things that we think will give them a greater capacity. And then we need a curriculum that focuses on equity. And the equitable curriculum is not one that focuses on large amounts of content, but focuses on small amounts of content, but really pushes the focal point out from that small amount of content into the understanding. Which is why driving is such a successful learning experience. Small body of knowledge, lots of experience, trial and error, play it yourself, practice, practice, done. Because if you think about it, learning to read and write is five to seven thousand hours. Learning to drive is about twenty hours in practice. Twenty hours you're on the motorway. Doing the most cognitively demanding task you'll ever do in your lifetime. All that data coming in. If you think about it, cognition is about your sensory systems, all twenty-three of them, bringing in data into your head in a single stream, and you having to make a whole lot of decisions around it. Driving is the most complex thing you will ever do in your life, unless you run a nuclear reactor or something like that, you know, fly the space shuttle somewhere. It's, time. Okay. it's incredibly complex, yet every single kid manages to get their license, generally speaking. There's a few exceptions, but generally speaking, they get it. So we have to learn from teaching driving and ask ourselves, what can we learn from that that gives us a better capacity to teach kids Scientific concepts, artistic concepts, communication concepts. How do we do that? So, to build that concept curriculum, okay, in New Zealand you can teach a concept curriculum. You can choose to teach the national curriculum or the concept curriculum. Right? So, we wrote one five years ago, and for some bizarre reason, the minister said, yeah, yeah, that's a reasonable alternative. You can teach the concept curriculum, you can teach Mark Trigger's concept curriculum, or teach the national curriculum. It's a bizarre notion, really, that someone could actually write a curriculum for a country on a Wednesday afternoon. It's just, it's just bizarre, really, but that's, what we're, that's the situation we're in. Australians now are looking at a concept curriculum for their national curriculum to replace the present one. So we're just writing position papers at the moment for the um, Australian government, for ACARA, and the Australian National Curriculum Group, uh, on the transition from a content-driven curriculum to a concept-driven curriculum. And personally, I don't want the Australians to beat us at this, so I'm stalling the whole exercise. So, <laughs> yeah. so I would like us to be there first, you know, because that's uh, where we should be. Uh, we'll be people in netball, we'll be people in rugby, we'll be people in education, that'd be much more impressive. Okay? And we've got a huge head start on them, they're still discovering that laptops actually for kids is not a very good idea. Um, and they spent about $2 billion on that. <laughs> They've also spent $1.4 billion uh, building learning management systems, and uh, none of them have worked. So they've actually bailed the whole lot. So $1.4 billion. Okay, in Australia, building learning management systems, not a single one works. So they've buried all of them now. They've buried the last few weeks ago, okay, officially. 
Right? So building learning management systems is not an easy task, as we know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what we're doing now is to ask ourselves the most questions around how can we build a learning management system that actually better replicates the sorts of things we actually need. So in the past, the learning management system was about getting content into a space so kids could find it 24-7. Well, actually now, they've got all sorts of devices where they can find that stuff on. You know, they don't necessarily need a learning management system to find stuff. They can find stuff on here. So as adults, when you need to know something, where do you go? Google. Where do kids go when they need to find something? They go to? Facebook. Facebook. YouTube. Yes. And Facebook. Because they have learned very, very quickly that they can learn in seven minutes by watching a video. It will take them about four weeks to read the 250 page book. Of course, we've banned YouTube because that's a silly thing. It's much too efficient. Okay? Because we are of the text generation and we actually were successful in the text generation. Therefore, we would want to replicate that in front of us. Our status is around text. Right? That's where your status is. You were the successes because you chose your parents well and they could read and write well. Because they had multiple generations of reading and writing sitting behind them. It gave them a genetic advantage. However, kids are realising that, you know, and I include myself in that sort of realm of kids, if I want to know something these days, I just. YouTube. Mm. I don't Google it. I don't want to read words. Yeah. Okay? I just play the video, I just listen to it and watch it. If I don't get it, I just rewind it. Yeah? And the video doesn't say, for goodness sakes, what's wrong with you? How many times do I have to show you this? <laughs> Teachers don't say that to kids, but it's implicit just in the say, okay, right here, one more time. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, uh, don't ask after twice. You know, twice is about it, really, you know. Otherwise, you really are just a bit slow learner. But the video doesn't do that. You just keep going back and forth. The car and academy and all these video libraries now that are building out there are hugely successful you know, with kids. The teachers aren't actually marching down saying, just go to the car and academy, don't be me, just watch the video. It's much better than I am. <laughs> because our state has been in a situation, I can remember, there's been teaching, and it's embarrassing how to think about it. I can remember uh, getting the kids into the room. Uh, 30 years ago teaching, um, and saying, right, actually, you know the deal here? I don't need you. You do need me. Okay? And if you want my help, then you've got to be nice and behave yourself in this classroom, otherwise you can go find something else. You know? Because I actually just want people who want to learn here. Alright? Because in fact, you need to pass. I don't get paid any more just because you pass better or worse. I get paid exactly the same. Yeah. This is terrible approach to teaching. Okay. <laughs> That's what we did, you know? Because they, because they had no other way of getting the information in a textbook, but they had to read that. So I could interpret it for them, you know, and use language more appropriate to their needs, etc., etc., do experiments and they, you know, can try and make it interesting. But now, kids can bypass me and just go, bang, and learn. So this is the first generation that will do a tertiary education process which isn't actually dependent on reading and writing. You thought about that? Because they will be able to submit a video clip. Just like you do in the knowledge net. You go to the knowledge net, click on the video button, and bang, tell me about what you did. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Or you could write a 350 word essay. Yeah, I'll do the video, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and in one minute, as an educator, you've got a much clearer idea about what this is all about than if they wrote a 350 word essay. That's why that tool in the knowledge net now, the video and the audio capacity to reflect you know, and actually pass on to the, uh, the learning journals, is the most powerful thing we've ever produced. And is the most powerful learning tool ever produced to date for a class of years. But that's one thing. You know, it's a one trick pony, so it's good what that taught us straight away was what other good things are there out there we should be doing. Because you know? that was a really powerful tool. And who's using it now? That video upload and audio upload. And it's, it is a brilliant tool. And once you get your parents' headspaces around that, 
they can actually listen to their child read, with the teacher making a little commentary on the long side of that, say, you know, when they get home tonight, can you just make sure the ball of pause a bit longer on those full stops and commas? Yeah. So you're sending an instruction home just in a video clip. You don't have to write it all out. I would hope in three years' time we'll look back and say, remember when we used to write reports? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> when we used to use green screens? Oh, 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 you know? <laughs> all those sort of stuff, you know. You won't write reports. Now I know you're, just, you're totally upset about this because I don't know how much you love that. <laughs> you know? But we know that report writing is a waste of time. That's why we don't like doing it. We know we don't do a good job because for some reason all the reports have to go on the same day. I don't know who made up that rule, but it's a really, really dumb rule. You know? Why can't we send the year twos out a different date to the year threes? Who cares? Let's put it all on the same day and let's make sure that all the technology will definitely crash. <laughs> <laughs> we don't question things, do we? You know, and whether that's in the banda room, bandering out the other things, or kind of photocopying them, or electronically sending them out. Why is it all on the same day? That's just an absolute nonsense. It's just a historical record of what happened. They failed the test. We didn't give them another go. We just say learn from this process. Because that's what drivers do, isn't it? You fail your driving test, you get another go, and another go, and it'll happen until you get it. See, driving's got it all over in terms of class education things. They fully get the whole plan. Knowledge small, get lots of multiple chances of passing the test. Put all the answers online, <laughs> so you can cheat. Bring any device you like into the thing here. So it's something we have to learn from. So in terms of that, what we're looking at doing at the moment is um, I'm going to get a copy of the code, and um, I've got a company in Australia called Circle. And what we're going to do is actually take the code base, and at the moment, in the, in the code base, it's like a, a a big jar of Smarties, all different colours. Okay? So the stuff you want to do is all jumbled inside there. So when we wrote it, uh, what we call the presentation layer, and what it looks like is jumbled in and around database instructions. So it's all a jumbled up mess. So some of you say, just, can't you make it look better? <laughs> what we have to do to do that is extract all the red Smarties out of the jar, which takes forever. Okay? rebuild that and put them all back in the same place they came from. It's just too hard. So what we're going to do basically is going to pull the presentation layer out, bolt it into the knowledge net, and stick it out here in the database and separate the two. What that also means is we can do something quite interesting. At the moment when uh, you've got your iPads, etc., when you use your iPad, anything you do on the iPad stays on the iPad. It's like, you know, on the footy tour, if everyone's on the footy cap, the footy tour stays on the footy tour. Okay, well, that thing here is the same sort of thing. It's a personal device. So if, if you want to see what the child's done on their iPad, you can't go somewhere and find it, can you? You've got to actually go and look at the iPad to see what they've done. So what we've realised, and uh, they've been working on the women's the last uh, six months probably, what we've realised is actually you can export data from the iPad to a web application. Okay, we've worked out how to do that. So what we're going to do essentially is build a series of apps okay, which will sit outside the presentation layer and the database. And those apps will actually fit will use, so for example, the first thing we'll do is the inquiry learning app. Okay. So when they do the inquiry learning app, they'll be using the app but the data they're putting into their machines will be exported to the knowledge net. So then the teacher can see all the kids' results on a single page, just like you can down the learning journals. So it's our first attempt at sort of gathering data from different spaces, putting it into the same space. Right. And so when you all use your iPads or phones, whatever device you like, because we are heading towards a BYOD, you know, you bring your own device environment, whatever device they use, the app will actually configure itself to that device. So an app in, on an iPhone will look different to an app on a larger Galaxy screen, which will look different to an app on the iPad. Same app, but it will represent itself differently depending on the size of the screen. It goes, oh, this is a bigger screen, we'll present it like this. It's a small screen, so we'll present it like that. 
So what we're going to do is a multiplicity of diagrams. This is my little drama that I'm going to be inquiring to show you in a minute. You know, and I've got to do hundreds of diagrams so that they'll scale up and look different on different size screens. And so then the data you put into that then will be collated by the knowledge net. You'll be able to see the progress of the children as an educator. And the kids will be able to see that from home from an internet enabled device with a bigger screen. Does that make sense? Okay. So the first ones we're building is the inquiry app, the collaboration app, and a questioning app. So the kids can then just use those apps to guide them through the process on their device, whatever that device looks like. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're now looking, we've got about 13 apps we're going to build over the next two years. But those three apps will hopefully be available in June next year. And by June next year, we'll hopefully the knowledge net will be functioning in this app world. Right? As opposed to, it'll still work as, a, as, as you use at the moment. Okay? But as time goes on, the kids will be using their devices which they will pay for, that's really cool. Okay? They will download their apps at their cost, that's really cool. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take those costs out of the equation for schools and make them a parental cost. Right? Now, some kids will need support. But if you think about it, if you're not buying laptops, you're not buying hardware, you're not buying software anymore, that means you've got a treasure trove of money you can distribute to some of those kids who actually need the support they actually require. So you've got to try and work that one out. And what I suggest to you is actually start up a trust, all the schools start up a trust, that it actually is managed by a group of community people. You'll be in there too, because they're in the school, and decide who gets what, where, and when, and how. How does that all work? Okay, because that'll be different for every community as a problem you name. Know? Some communities won't even trust at all because the parents are all jolly wealthy, and they can all afford a smartphone for their kids if they wanted to. And some can't. But what we want to do is reduce that cost and also the responsibility. So, if there are any technicians in the room? Because you probably won't have a job in a couple of years. <laughs> so, one of our big focus, and Doug Sarah and I had a conversation about three years ago now, the ministry caused a lot of uh, issues because someone then actually uh, put it on their blog and put it out there. We basically said, let's eradicate technicians. Because generally speaking, they're starting to take over the entire school. Any principles of what good teaching should look like. You know, can we do this? No, I should be cooked, but I don't like that. I like this. You know, what I need downstairs in my in my lab, I need a 38 inch screen. Yeah, you know, says the technician. You know? And technicians are having an extraordinary powerful role in schools. You know, they're sitting on the board of trustees, you know, all the sort of important decision land, because they're really important. Now we're shifting to a cloud service, which is out of school already. And now we want to shift the devices out of your control as well. Not that they don't trust you, because really, why should schools be doing that? So that's the other shift. So in terms of Watchdog, what Watchdog are doing is building that cloud environment. Okay, where, where everything is, you know, single sign-on. Why don't you do that, you know? Single sign-on is really, really important. Interoperable, that's really, really important. Okay, we're going to reuse, you know, re into the data 50,000 times. And the devices, you know, will not be laptops the kids have, guaranteed. Okay, they're too bulky, the batteries don't last long enough, they're just, they're just a nuisance, really. Okay, they'll use phones and iPads and galaxies and all sorts of different devices. And recognize the only deal we've got to actually get through to kids is the fact that when they come into the school, they must use the school network. Okay? If they don't use the school network, we cut them out of the whole equation. You know, we take their devices off them, and then that's like putting off their knees. So you don't have to do that once or twice, I'm imagining, and they'll soon get the general idea. So, what does that sort of look like? How much time, by the way? 20 minutes. So, um, if we look at inquiry, for example, uh, yeah. so 
if we look at um, the square one in here. So on a small screen, English level three. The curious thing about inquiry is that it's different for every subject area. So English inquiry is a very different process to scientific inquiry. Social inquiry is a different process to mathematical inquiry. Is that true? You're not convinced, are you? Okay. So in science, for example, science is about repeating experiments to make sure we get the same result, to show that the variable that's actually making the difference is variable A or B or C. We don't really, not really interested in science about people's opinions about what they think, etc., in terms of social processes. Whereas in social inquiry, we're very few <coughs> people here. So the process is quite different. And also, uh, inquiry is developmental. In other words, inquiry at level one, if we go and grab some inquiry at level one, So if we get a level one science, okay, this is what it looks like. So level one science, um, it's just like reading that stuff really, you know, five, six, seven years old. What is the idea you'd like to test? Talk about your groups, chat and record some stuff. How you best test your idea, see if that might work? Record what happened, you tested your idea. Okay. Reflect on that. Where did that idea come from? Because the inquiry is not a linear process, it goes step one, step two, step three, step four. You get down to the inquiry, right? And talk about that. Let's actually change our idea back up here. So it's a dynamic process. And we work our way through and so, well, what did you discover? How do you share that with other people? So level one science, you can actually get through that entire process in about 20 minutes, a group of kids. One of the things we do have to get away from is this concept of everything must last three weeks, five weeks a term, or an entire year. Okay? Because some things don't. Right? And most concepts don't. You start mapping concepts. We've mapped uh, some years ago now. We mapped uh, the entire curriculum. Is it up here somewhere? There it is. There we go. As if I planned it almost. Okay, so if we go, what have we got here? This is social science, for example. Let's just go into one of the, um, uh, the curses into the content sometime. Here we go. We've got here. Uh, the attention community and the self interest of community. Level one, sometimes we can be selfish and sometimes we can be selfless. That's the concept. Okay? Uh, the learning intention is, well, sometimes we share with other people and sometimes we keep things for ourselves. How long does that take the kids to understand? Yeah. Not too long. long. <laughs> but to tell you what, you could turn it into a three week year's work if you wanted to. <laughs> that's what, generally speaking, you do. Just take a simple concept and make it into a really big deal with lots of content. Keep the content small. Okay. The context, what well, food, pencils, paper, secrets. You choose contexts that are safe. So when you take kids driving, okay, you don't put them on a really steep hill to start with, do you? The context you choose is a safe one. And in learning, the safety of a context depends on the literacy and experience within that context. Right. So we have to make that safe. So each school just comes up with their own contexts. You don't describe them because where you are is going to be dependent on the resources you have, the environment you're in, the teachers you have, and that will de de decide the content. And in here we allow four bullet points only. That's it. Right? 
And that goes right through to senior chemistry. Four bullet points. That's it for the concept. Keep it nice and tight, because that makes us what actually is the, what they really need to know. Because as soon as you make the content large, you start to get that distribution curve straight away. Keep the content small, and everybody can pass. Equitably. Okay. So, and then the next thing in the series is, there's a natural human need for reward when our work is done. You know, we like reward if that's self, you know, I enjoy doing that, so we call, I get that internal reward, or it's an external reward. So we can talk about context, some internal reward stuff, some external reward stuff. Okay? What's the learning intention? People like to help, they also like to be thanked for the work they do. Yeah. Next, communities rely on people contributing to them by a paid and unpaid work. We often benefit from most from our own kindness and other consideration of others. And this is part of those competencies being embedded into the curriculum, explicitly taught. Three magical words, please. Sorry, thank you. Okay. You all know people that can't use some of those words. What does that do to them as a human being? It makes them difficult to live with, really, doesn't it? Okay. Why? Because they represent certain things, don't they? Sorry represents forgiveness. Generally speaking, people who can't say sorry can't forgive self. That generally is the link. Okay, so if you struggle with the word sorry, it's often because you've set standards or someone's put some thoughts you about setting standards where you can't actually achieve that. Okay. So, please, okay. Do you have to say please? Please is asking someone to do something for you, so that represents humility. Okay. Thank you. Do you have to say thank you? No. Okay but it's operating that thing of grace. Thank you. So grace, forgiveness, and humility. Three of the key... What do we call them? Concepts. So? Concepts. Yeah, concepts, yeah. Dispositions, okay. Absolutely critical. But kids need to be exposed to that explicitly. Otherwise, we won't get it. Our values, attitudes, and uh, qualities and puts a relationship between how much we take and how much we give within our community. This is social science, you know? I guess it's been social science. Okay? But they're explicit. But they're really quick. Most of them are only 30, 40 minute yeah. modules. <coughs> so there's lots of concepts, but they are very quick to teach. Yeah. Right? But they are explicit. So, when we're looking here in science, okay, this might take 25, 30 minutes. So what we have to ask ourselves in, in learning is how can we do teaching and learning efficiently? So it's level one, okay, then I can go to level two. In science, it gets a bit more complicated, okay, we're asking a few more questions. What's the key question? Talk about your group. What do we already know? What do we need to find out? What do you think might the solution might be? How can we test that? Okay, what happened when you did the test or experiment? Okay. How do you share that discovery? I'm oh, sorry, what, would, what, uh, what did you discover? What have you learned? How did you share that discovery? So you just, it's a series of guides. So kids would say, yeah, I'm doing a, what do you think that solution would be? Click, and what that would do on the device would open up a window. Now that's on a fairly large device. On a smaller device, uh, we would summarize that. If I haven't done science yet, let's grab what I have done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's that one here. If we hadn't sat up most of the last night talking to Dave Braddock, I'd have this much more organised. <laughs> this okay. So we can reduce that whole thing down to just keywords for smaller device. So this is the diagram for a smartphone, for example. Okay. So you click on that, and we've opened up a window and expand on that. Now, there's a wonderful uh, app. Uh, it's being developed just recently, which I really, really like, because it's actually saving us a lot of time. It's called Nearpod. Is anyone familiar with Nearpod? No, it's only, it's only been released about three or four months ago, and uh, the developers got in touch some time ago, and we managed to get sort of an early version of it. But I'm just going to show you a little clip of uh, Nearpod. So 
Getting started with your Nearpod experience. Launch the Nearpod feature app from the instructor's device and sign in using the username and password you created. From the My Library page, tap on the launch button below the presentation you wish to use. Now launch the Nearpod student app from the student's device and select Tap to Enter PIN. When prompted, enter the presentation identification number located at the top of the Nearpod feature. The second slide of any Nearpod presentation will require students to log in. Only a first name and last name is required. The rest of the fields are optional. Continue to swipe left to advance your class through the presentation in a linear sequence. Tap on the scrubber below to go into preview mode and navigate the presentation. Then tap on Share to push the current slide into your students' devices. During a quiz, students can move at their own pace. To view reference images, double tap on the image or pinch out to enlarge. Pinch in to minimize. After students have submitted their answers, tap on Share to share the aggregate results. Students can tap on the My Answers tab to review their answers and see how they did. So you can load up PDFs, videos into this by dragging and dropping them into a square, move the next one along, put the next one in so you can create a... During drawings, students draw their responses and tap submit to send it to the Nearpod teacher. After students have submitted their answers, tap on any drawing to preview the submissions, then tap on share to push the current drawing onto your students' devices. This is like feeding back to the During the free text questions, students tap on the answer box to expose the keyboard and then type their answers. Tap on submit to send the answer to the Nearpod teacher. Now, enjoy the Nearpod experience. So, creating a Nearpod linear sequence is really, really easy. It literally is just dragging and dropping things into squares and you can then just move them and rearrange, etc. When the kids do them, then you can actually see that on the teacher app. Now they've actually got a quite a convoluted process to get that data out of here into there. And we've actually come up with a much simpler idea in terms of data movement for what you can do in the knowledge net. Okay, so we've simplified the process. The other thing we uh, don't want to do is have a linear experience. Okay, A, B, C, D, or oh, 4 out of 5. You can see all the Americanisms inside of here. Okay, what we want more is a more dynamic approach. Okay, so we've got over some of that stuff, but what Nearpod allowed us to grab hold of is how do you actually drag and drop that stuff in there on, on such a small app? You know, how do you actually do that? So they've done that. It's very, very clever. We've been able to drill in and see how they've done that, which will give us a lot of clues around how we take inquiry as a process and turn it into a dynamic space. So when you click on the, uh, the uh, symbol here, it opens up the page and there's a, a Nearpod type approach inside there where you can drag and drop whatever you've done into that space and it'll record it. Okay? And it records to a database and the teacher can then actually look at the student's database just like you see the learning journals with when do people log in and what, where the results are, etc., etc. And what we also want to do is then pump that up into the Curriculum Manager, which is another uh, app we're going to build as well. And the Curriculum Manager is really uh, a, and some of you may or may not have seen this actually in the knowledge that it already exists in a sort of prototype form. Uh, what do I want? I want uh, so let's log into uh, the knowledge net for a minute. Inside the knowledge net, in, some of you won't have seen, uh, but it's actually sitting in the background, is a curriculum framework. So I can come into the competencies, for example, and click on Manage Yourself, and that pops Manage Yourself. And what we're going to do is going to take those, uh, the work the child has done in the inquiry app, and it's going to populate this into another area in here, which will be student work. And the students will then collate their work over the developing concept framework. 
So they're going to go back and see what they did. And if the teacher says, yep, yeah, that demonstrates an understanding of that concept, off you go to the next one, or their peers might do that, or their parents might contribute to that process as well. Then they can go back and see when they get to the next one. So some children in the class will be able to actually move through that framework quite quickly. Other kids will get to hear, go, I don't, don't get it. Because concept development from a cognitive perspective is a little bit random. Okay? Have you ever wondered why some kids can't get some concepts? No matter how hard you try with them, they just don't get it. Okay? And maths is particular around this. So, for example, in algebra, we teach algebra from what age? When do we introduce kids to uh, variables? How old? Nine. 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 Yeah. Year one. <laughs> An abstract variable. Okay. Year nine. Year nine. Yeah, it should be about year ten, eleven. Because cognitively, you can't actually understand an abstract variable until you're about 15, 16 years old. Right. So if you introduce it earlier, what learning is going to be happening in your head? How do you have to teach it by rote? Mm. Yeah. So that's what's happened. We've pushed all the concepts in mathematics so far down now that the kids can't get the concept. The only alternative is to actually engage that other learning system, that pathetically boring one, <laughs> called learning by rote. And it's also pathetic because, in fact, 500 years ago, how much content did you have to remember 500 years ago? Nothing. Virtually nothing. Mm, nothing. Yeah, you know, 60 people in the town, they conveniently named Baker, Carpenter, <laughs> you know. No reading, no letters, no you know, words. You have to remember some words, okay. but our vocabulary has just ballooned in the last, you know, it's just, you know, a fact of a hundred times since Shakespeare has been some new vocabulary. We have actually a way to text. So our right learning five hundred years ago was really minimal. So there were no real drivers, biological drivers, uh, evolutionary drivers, to improve right learning. But five hundred years ago, what concepts were you doing? Risk, finding food, status, relationships, place, space, time. There's tons of them. We've been doing concepts on this planet for at least 200,000 years. Because we've got actually images from South Africa just recently on a cave down there, which are older than the ones in France now, uh, go back 110,000 years, of things drawn in a three dimensional perspective. Which is a concept. Okay. So you've had 150,000 years, plus 200,000 years of that evolutionary thing driving, which is why we do concepts so well and learn so well. So if you wonder why everybody passes the driving test, but not everyone passes the spelling test, it's about what happened in our heads over the last 100,000 years. So. It's critical that we sort of acknowledge, first of all, we have three learning systems. One is learning by rote, one is learning concepts. Rote, hopeless, boring, tedious, concepts. Actually, when you have the aha moment, do you go, oh yeah, I get it. We go, I get it. You know? It's a totally different thing. And the other thing about concepts is that there's no temporary, short term, and long term. Once you get a concept, bang, it's in there. And we save it holographically. Okay. Okay. Holographically means, in fact, if you get a hologram, a three dimensional picture of a hologram, and go to a wild bear or a, a kiwi or something of that nature, if you can cut it into four pieces, you'll get four kiwis. Which is why I can move half your brain and you don't lose your memory. Mm -hmm. In fact, the world record is 8%. A woman in the UK, she's 30, in her early 30s now, she's a concert pianist. She has 8% of her brain yeah. you know, She's not, uh, you know, out there sort of trying to work out where to go. You know, she's actually fully, fully there, you know. She's a concert pianist. Fantastic. Okay. So, 
Learning by rote is tedious, boring, we're not good at it. Learning concepts, we're jolly good at it. We have to learn them really, really fast. And it's equitable, which is the major draw card as far as I'm concerned. Okay? And then on top of that, you've got the imagination and creativity, okay? which is managed by your brainwaves. And we're realizing now that you can actually leverage that. You can actually activate certain brainwave frequencies in your brain by just thinking. Okay? To try and improve that. So what the knowledge that we're trying to do the knowledge net now is create an environment that actually works with that knowledge. <coughs> Building a conceptual architecture, okay, keep the body of knowledge really small so that everybody can actually have success in a BYOD environment. In an environment where you are crafting the capacity for those children to become lifelong learners by the time they leave school after 13 years. Anything that takes us away from that is pretty crappy actually. So standards, pretty crappy stuff actually. So we're going to have a bit of a push in the next 12 months to get rid of that stuff. Okay, and so I'm enlisting sort of the principles and things with the association, etc. to sort of get together and go, actually, no. And get some PR the parents to explain why this is a really, really dumb plan. Many of data, so we back to that. So we need to keep our eye on the ball and not get sucked into this pathetically boring, rote learn stuff they can reproduce in the test. And it was, oh, aren't they clever? No, they're not. Parrots can do that. <laughs> Dolphins can do that. Monkeys can do that. It's not particularly clever. Right? What is clever is being able to understand an idea or a concept or a concept framework and go, Ah, I get it. And what's more, if we did this and this, we could do something totally new like this. That is clever. Right? That really is. Testing it though requires a qualitative environment, not a quantitative one. So we need an assessment system, that, and we've got it already, NCA is a fantastic <coughs> assessment environment. It really is. We become much better when in fact we don't all go to sort of meet around a desk somewhere and show each other their sort of A's and B's and compare them and contrast them and say, well yeah, this is the standard, this is what the sound should look like. Because that should all be done of course in the knowledge net electronically, which you can because all their artifacts are sitting in their database. So we should be able to be able to insert an electronic knitting needle through and take a sample out just to make sure that, yep, roughly speaking, they look about the same in terms of demonstrating understanding. And the way they're going to demonstrate their understanding is through mostly video. Showing I can do. Showing I understand. Being given a different context is the testing process. It's very simple. If you think about testing for a, a license, right, it's very simple. All the, drug, all the testing agent does is take them to a place they possibly haven't been before. A new context. Because the fantastic power of concepts is they allow you to predict. And we are the only species that can form new concepts on the fly. We are absolutely unique. At 3%, jolly, jolly important. To understand maths, 3% is not just three little bits more, it's actually a huge factorial. You understand factorials? Okay. That's what makes the difference. Good luck, you need it. Thanks very much. <laughs> now, some time for some questions. Because what time are we supposed to finish? About now. About now? <laughs> About now. Okay, right there. I'll be around uh, through the course of the day, and if you want to come and learn a bit more about the brain, we can talk about this afternoon. Otherwise, enjoy your day. Thank you very much.